Chapter 4 Tribbles, Dikus and the Vision of a Golden Age In 1895, a man named Birsa was seen roaming the forest and villages of Chota Nagpur in Jharkhand. People said he had miraculous powers, he could cure all diseases and multiply grain. Birsa himself declared that God had appointed him to save his people from trouble, free them from the slavery of Dikus outsiders. Soon thousands began following Birsa, believing that he was Bhagwan God and had come to solve all their problems. Birsa was born in a family of Mundas, a tribal group that lived in Chota Nagpur. But his followers included other tribals of the region, Santhals and Uraans. All of them in different ways were unhappy with the changes they were experiencing and the problems they were facing under British rule. Their familiar ways of life seemed to be disappearing, their livelihoods were under threat, and their religion appeared to be in danger. What problems did Birsa set out to resolve? Who were the outsiders being referred to as Dikus and how did they enslave the people of the region? What was happening to the tribal people under the British? How did their lives change? These are some of the questions you will read about in this chapter. You have read about tribal societies last year. Most tribes had customs and rituals that were very different from those laid down by Brahmins. These societies also did not have the sharp social divisions that were characteristics of caste societies. Although they belonged to the same tribe thought of themselves as sharing common ties of kinship, however, this did not mean that there were no social and economic differences within tribes. How did tribal groups live? By the 19th century, tribal people in different parts of India were involved in a variety of activities. Some were jhum cultivators, some of them practiced jhum cultivation that is shifting cultivation. This was done on small patches of land mostly in forests. The cultivators cut the tree troughs to allow sunlight to reach the ground and burnt the vegetation on the land to clear it for cultivation. They spread the ash from the firing which contained potash to fertile the soil. They used the axe to cut trees and the hoe to scratch the soil in order to prepare it for cultivation. They broadcast the seeds that is scattered the seeds on the field instead of plowing the land and sowing the seeds once the crop was ready and harvested. They moved to another field. A field that had been cultivated once was left fallow for several years. Shifting cultivators were found in the hilly and the forested tracts of North, East and Central India. The lives of these tribal people depended on free movements within forests and on being able to use the land and forest for growing their crops. That is the only way they could practice shifting cultivation. Some were hunters and gatherers. In many regions, tribal groups lived by hunting animals and gathering forest produce. They saw forests as essential for survival. The Khorns were such a community living in the forests of Odisha. They regularly went out on collective hunts and then divided the meat amongst themselves. They ate fruits and roots collected from the forest and cooked food with the oil they extracted from the seeds of the sal and maua. They used many forest shrubs and herbs for medicinal purposes and sold forest produce in the local markets. The local weavers and leather workers turned to the corns when they needed supplies of cushion and palas flowers to color their cloths and leathers. From where did these forest people get their supplies of rice and other grains? At times they exchanged goods, getting what they needed in return for their valuable forest produce. At other times they bought goods with the small amount of earnings they had. Some of them did not earn jobs in the villages, carrying loads or building roads while others labored in the fields of peasants and farmers. When supplies of forest produce shrank, tribal people had to increasingly wander around in search of work as laborers. But many of them, like the Bagas of central India, were reluctant to do work for others. The Bagas saw themselves as people of the forest who could only live in produce of the forest. It was below the dignity of a Baga to become a laborer. Tribal groups often needed to buy and sell in order to be able to get the goods that were not produced within the locality. This led to their dependence on traders and money lenders. 
Traders came around with things for sale and sold the goods at high prices. Money lenders gave loans and which the tribals met their cash needs, adding to what they earned but the interest charged on the loans was usually very high. So for the tribals, market and commerce often meant debt and poverty. They therefore came to see the money lender and trader as evil outsiders and the cause of their misery. Some herded animals. Many tribal groups lived by herding and rearing animals. They were pastoralists who moved with their herds of cattle or sheep according to the seasons. When the grass in one place was exhausted, they moved to another area. The Van Gujars of the Punjab Hills and the Labadis of Andhra Pradesh were cattle herders. The Gaddis of Kunnu were shepherds and the Bakarwals of Kashmir reared goats. You will read more about them in your history book next year. Some took to settled cultivation. Even before the 19th century, many from within the tribal groups had begun settling down and cultivating their fields in one place year after year instead of moving from place to place. They began to use the plough and occasionally got rights over the land they lived on in many cases. Like the Mundas of the Chota Nagpur, the land belonged to the clan as a whole. All members of the clan were regarded as descendants of the original settlers who had first cleared the land. Therefore, all of them had rights on the land. Very often, some people within the clan acquired more power than others. Some became chiefs and other followers. Powerful men often rented out their land instead of cultivating it themselves. British officials saw settled tribal groups like the Gonds and Santhals as more civilized than hunters, gatherers, or shifting cultivators. Those who lived in the forests were considered to be wild and savage. They needed to be settled and civilized. How did colonial rule affect tribal lives? The lives of tribal groups changed during British rule. Let us see what these changes were. What happened to tribal chiefs? Before the arrival of the British in many areas, the tribal chiefs were important people. They enjoyed a certain amount of economic power and had the right to administer and control their territories. In some places, they had their own police and decided on the local rules of land and forest management. Under British rule, the functions and powers of the tribal chief changed considerably. They were allowed to keep their land title over a cluster of villages and rent out lands, but they lost much of their administrative power and were forced to follow laws made by British officials in India. They also had to pay tribute to the British and discipline the tribal groups on behalf of the British. They lost the authority they had earlier enjoyed amongst their people and were unable to fulfill their traditional functions. What happened to the shifting cultivation? The British were uncomfortable with groups who moved about and did not have a fixed home. They wanted tribal groups to settle down and become peasant cultivators. Settled peasants were easier to control and administer than people who were always on the move. The British also wanted a regular revenue source for the state. So they introduced land settlements that is. They measured the land, defined the rights of each individual to the land, and fixed the revenue demand for the state. Some peasants were declared land owners, others tenants. As you have seen, chapter 2, the tenants were to pay rent to the land owner, who in turn paid revenue to the state. The British effort to settle home cultivators was not very successful. Settled plough cultivation is not easy in areas where water is scarce and the soil is dry. In fact, Jhum cultivators who took to plough cultivation often suffered since their field did not produce good yields. So the Jhum cultivators in Northeast India insisted on continuing with their traditional practice. Facing widespread protest, the British had to ultimately allow them the right to carry on shifting cultivation in some parts of the forest. Forest laws and their impact the life of tribal groups, as you have seen, was directly connected to the forest, so changes in forest laws had a considerable effect on tribal lives. The British extended their control over all forests and declared that forests were state property. Some forests were classified as reserved forest for they produced timber which the British wanted. In these forest, people were not allowed to move freely. Practice jung cultivation, collect fruits or hunt animals. How were jung cultivators to survive in such a situation? 
Many were therefore forced to move in such a situation. Many were therefore forced to move to other areas in search of work and livelihood. But once the British stopped the tribal people from living inside forests, they faced a problem from where would the forest department get its neighbor to cut trees for railway slippers and to transport logs. Colonial officials came up with a solution. They decided that they would keep June cultivators in small patches of land in the forest and allow them to cultivate these on the condition that those who lived in the village would have to provide labor to the forest department and took after the forests. So in many regions, the forest department established forest villages to ensure a regular supply of cheap labor. Many tribal groups reacted against the colonial forest law. They disobeyed the new rules, continued with practices that were declared illegal, and at time rose in open rebellion. Such was the revolt of Son Ground Sangama in 1906 in Assam and the forest Satyagraha of the 1930s in the central provinces. The problem with trade during the 19th century, tribal groups found that traders and money lenders were coming into the forest more often, wanting to buy forest produce, offering cash loans and asking them to work for wages. It took tribal groups some time to understand the consequences of what was happening. Let us consider the case of the silk growers. In the 18th century, Indian silk was in demand. In European markets, the fine quality of Indian silk was highly valued and exports from India increased rapidly. As the market expanded, East India Company officials tried to encourage silk production to meet the growing demand. Hajari Bak in present-day Jharkhand was an area where the Santhals reared cocoons. The traders dealing in silk sent in their agents who gave loans to the tribal people and collected the cocoons. The growers were paid Rs. 3 to Rs. 4 for a thousand cocoons. These were then exported to Bordwan or Gaya, where they were sold at five times the price. The middlemen so called because they arranged deals between the exporters and silk growers made huge profits. The silk growers earned very little understandably. Many tribal groups saw the market and the traders as their main enemies. The search for work. The plight of the tribals who had to go far away from their homes in search of work was even worse. From the late 19th century, tea plantations started coming up and mining became an important industry. Tribals were recruited in large numbers to work the tea plantations of Assam and the coal mines of Jharkhand. They were recruited through contractors who paid them miserably low wages and prevented them from returning home. A closer look. Through the 19th and 20th century, tribal groups in different parts of the country rebelled against the changes in laws, the restrictions on their practices, the new taxes they had to pay, and the exploitations by traders and money lenders. The coast rebelled in 1831 to 1832. Santhals rose in revolt in 1855. The Bastar Rebellion in central India broke out in 1910 and the Warli revolt in Maharashtra in 1914. The movement that Birsa led was one such movement. Birsa Munda Birsa was born in the mid-1870s, the son of a poor father. He grew up around the forests of Bohonda, grazing sheep, playing the flute and dancing in the local Akhada. Forced by poverty, his father had to move from place to place looking for work. As an adolescent, Birsa heard tales of the Munda uprisings of the past and saw the Sirdar's leaders of the community urging the people to revolt. They talked of a golden age when the Mundas had been free of the oppressions of the Kus and said there would be a time when the ancestral rights of the community would be restored. They see themselves as the descendants of the original settlers of the region fighting for their land, Munk Ki Ladai, reminding people of the need to win back their kingdom. Birsa went to local missionary school and listened to the sermons of the missionaries. There too he heard it said that it was possible for the Mundas to attain the kingdom of heaven and regain their lost rights. This would be possible if they became good Christians and gave up their bad practices. Later Birsa also spent some time in the company of a prominent Vaishnava preacher.
he wore the sacred thread and began to value the importance of purity and pity. Mirza was deeply influenced by many of the ideas he came in touch with in his growing up years. His movement was aimed at reforming tribal society. He urged the Mundas to give up drinking liquor, clean their villages, and stop believing in witchcraft and sorcery. But we must remember that Birsa also turned against missionaries and Hindu landlords. He saw them as outside forces that were ruining the Munda way of life. In 1895, Birsa urged his followers to recover their glorious past. He talked of a golden age in the past, a Satyug, the age of truth when Mundas lived a good life, constructed embankments, tapped natural springs, planted trees and orchards, practiced cultivation to earn their living. They did not kill their brethren and relatives. They lived honestly. Birsa also wanted people to once again work on their land, settle down and cultivate their fields. What worried British officials most was the political aim of a Birsa movement, for it wanted to drive out missionaries, money lenders, Hindu landlords and the government and set up a Munda Raj with Birsa at its head. The movement identified all these forces as the cause of the misery the Mundas were suffering. The land policies of the British were destroying their traditional land system. Hindu landlords and money lenders were taking over their land and missionaries were criticizing their traditional culture. As the movement spread, the British officials described to act. They arrested Birsa in 1895, convicted him on charges of writing and jailed him for two years. When Birsa was released in 1897, he began touring the villages to gather support. He used traditional symbols and language to rouse people, urging them to destroy Ravan, Dikhus and the Europeans and stabilize a kingdom under the leadership. Birsa's followers began targeting the symbols of Diku and followers began targeting the symbol of Diku and European power. They attacked police stations and churches and raided the property of moneylenders and jamidars. They raised the white flag as a symbol of Birsa Raj. In 1900, Birsa died of cholera and the movement faded out. However, the movement was significant in at least two ways. First, it forced the colonial government to introduce laws so that the land of the tribals could not be easily taken over by the Kuz. Second, it showed once again that the tribal people had the capacity to protest against injustice and express their anger against colonial rule. They did this in their own specific way, inventing their own rituals and symbols of struggle.